It's a tremendous honor to be asked to speak in a, at a conference in honor of, uh, of Marceau Berger, uh, who was a towering figure of 20th century differential geometry and, uh, and had so many other uh, contributions in other directions in mathematics. Uh, uh, in my own personal uh, development, he was, uh, he was absolutely fundamental. I, as a graduate student studying the sphere theorem, uh, I was, uh, it was maybe the first time I'd really seen how, how much information you could get out of very carefully estimating things and, uh, and, uh, and uh, being absolutely persistent about finding the right way to do it. Uh, it, was, uh, it made a big impression on me. At the time, uh, I was completely unaware of, the, of his thesis work, which would become fundamental for my own, uh, for my own mathematical career. Uh, his thesis work was in, was of course classifying the, uh, the Ramanian holonomies. And uh, it, it was he who discovered that, uh, that, that G2 and spin seven in dimension seven and eight were possible as holonomy groups. And uh, although they didn't actually construct any examples that would uh, that would not happen for another nearly 30 years. Uh, the uh, uh, that the that amazing uh, attention to detail and care that went into actually doing that classification was made a huge impression on me. And it's probably uh, you know you may have noticed, and if you look in uh, some of Berger's early papers at that time, there. Are big lists of tables of things, you know, the, the, uh, the answers that you get after you, uh, after you do a very, very careful and detailed analysis of, uh, of the possibilities. And, uh, and of course, that made a big impression on me too. And, uh, and so, um, one of the things I want to talk about today is, uh, is an outgrowth of this uh, special holonomy, this work on special holonomy manifolds, uh, looking at uh, uh, again, uh, looking at geometrically natural conditions on special holonomy manifolds, and trying to uh, and trying to determine uh, when that can be used for uh, for constructing new examples. Uh, one thing that was always very mysterious when we first came produced proofs that these uh, that these special holonomy metrics existed in dimension seven and eight was that the equations themselves seem to be very complicated and, and trying to understand them locally, uh, which, was, uh, which was how I got involved in the story to begin with, was uh, uh, just didn't seem to be related to any, uh, any well-known or, or understandable system of PDE. Uh, finding, uh, finding a way to construct examples was, was hard and uh, Simon, and I uh, uh, worked on the uh, cohomogeneity one case, and uh, which is a geometrically natural condition, uh, and were able to construct uh, some complete examples, uh, the first known complete examples of, the, of these uh, special holonomy metrics. But uh, the more you study it, and the more you look at it, the more you realize you, the intuition that there should be some connection with integrable systems. It's not exactly clear what that connection should be, even now, what that, uh, but, uh, but finding ways to look at uh, either reductions or special cases uh, geometric by adding geometrically natural conditions was the thing that uh, is the theme that I want to take up because it does in fact lead to uh, connections with integrable systems. And, uh, and that's really the message I want to talk about today is that we have a way of constructing solutions now, or more ways of constructing solutions by looking at things as, as uh, integrable systems. But finding that uh, reduction to integrable systems takes, uh, takes, uh, uh, takes a, a couple of new ideas, and that's what I want to talk about. <clears throat> uh, first, let me uh, remind you uh, basically what the, what the story is uh, for a Ramanian manifold with a uh, holonomy group H, whoops, have I got the, there it is, holonomy group H sitting in the orthogonal group uh, with Lie algebra uh, fractor H in SON. Uh, the, uh, and this is very classical, it goes, it goes right back to, uh, right back to uh, uh, Berger's 
uh, original studies, the, the, uh, what one can do is, of course, write down the structure equations on the bundle of, uh, you know, the, on the holonomy bundle of associated to the, uh, associated to this manifold, that is, pick a frame, pick a, pick a particular frame at one point and translate it around by parallel transport and you'll get a, you'll get a sub-bundle of the frame bundle the, uh, that will be actually an H bundle, H reduction of the, of the orthogonal frame bundle and on that bundle you'll have the structure, the standard, stru the Carton structure equations, uh, the differential of the so-called soldering form is minus the connection form which the soldering form and then the curvature the expression of the curvature as a as an operator as as a linear map from the uh, as a linear map uh, from uh, actually it has in fact from the from the algebra to itself uh, the space of curvature tensors actually takes values in the in the quadratic uh, uh, sim two of the of the uh, of the holonomy algebra and in fact it's the kernel of the natural map of the thinking of thinking of uh, the holonomy algebra is sitting in SON, which is lambda 2 of Rn, uh, just taking the, just sending it in by wedge product into lambda 4. The kernel is in fact the set of things that, uh, that satisfy the Bianchi identities uh, to be the curvature tensor of a, uh, of a Riemannian manifold with holonomy H. Now, uh, in addition to the, in addition to the, uh, the first Bianchi identity, which is what gives us that the curvature tensor takes values in this uh, particular algebraically defined subspace, the second Bianchi identity tells you that, uh, tells you that uh, when you differentiate the curvature, the, uh, the first covariant derivative takes values in a certain subspace of, the, uh, of all the, you know, maps of, of Rn into, uh, into the space of curvature tensors. And in fact, it was Berger's, uh, Berger's careful analysis of these two spaces that led to his, uh, led to his classification. And uh, in, in particular, the case where this guy, where H acts irreducibly and, uh, and, and this space is more than one dimensional and this space is, uh, is, is in some sense large enough to, uh, to generate the entire, uh, the, the variations of the curvature that show up here. Uh, those, are the, those are the two conditions, the, the Berger conditions. And, uh, and in fact, it turned out that, 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 that those conditions which Berger proved were necessary, uh, ultimately, after a long, many years later, we were able to show that they were sufficient. And, uh, and so his, his criteria really were at the heart of the matter, uh, even though it took us a long time to realize that that was the, that was the essential thing. Uh, I'll just give a, a brief example, the concrete example that everybody can see. Uh, if you look at SU2 sitting in, uh, sitting in SO4, the, there's the, the connection form of the, on, the, on the SU2 bundle, takes values in the SU2 Lie algebra, uh, the structure equations, uh, when you, when you uh, compute the curvature, you get that the, uh, you get that the curvature uh, uh, takes values. This is, these are the two forms that correspond to the Lie algebra itself. It's actually a symmetric map from the, two from the Lie algebra to itself. Uh, and it's required, and it turns out it has to have trace zero. That's the, that's the, uh, the Bianchi identity comes in. So what that says is that the, is that the first, uh, that the space of curvature tensors is in fact traceless symmetric three by three matrices, is an irreducible representation R5, and uh, computation shows that the first covariant derivatives of curvature are this irreducible representation of SU2, which is simply uh, sim5 of C2. Uh, it's a 12 dimensional real space. Um, and, uh, and in fact, if you, as I'll say a little bit later, uh, in a certain sense, that, those algebraic facts are all you need to, uh, to apply Carton's machinery to prove that, uh, prove that SU2 occurs as holonomy of, uh, of, uh, of four manifolds. Uh, this was, of course, long before Kähler geometry or anybody knew anything about uh, uh, Calabi-Yau or anything like that. 
in fact, this was the first known non-trivial case of an irreducible holonomy. Uh, Carton just mentions it as a fact in his, uh, in his little book on Riemannian geometry. Uh, he doesn't give a proof or, uh, or, or, uh, or any argument. He just says, he just says the, the metrics with this holonomy depend on two functions of three variables. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll come back to where this two and three come from in a little bit. Uh, so anyway, the basic, pro the basic uh, problem is once you, once you believe that there exists such, such uh, uh, things with a given holonomy, is how to classify what the solutions are. That is, uh, determine up to diffeomorphism how many, in some sense, how many solutions there are to these equations, where theta takes values in the Lie algebra H and R takes values in the, uh, in the space of curvature tensors. Uh, <clears throat> this is a classic kind of problem that shows up, uh, shows up in Carton a lot. Uh, and uh, and there's a, there's a well-developed machinery for, uh, for understanding it. What I'm going to do is, con as I'm going to consider a, 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 a modified problem, is, uh, is instead of allowing the curvature tensor to take values in all of, the, all of the possible curvature space, I want to look at a natural subspace of the, of the space of curvature tensors and ask what are the solutions who take that, that take values in, uh, uh, where the curvature t t takes values in some subspace. And in order for this to be a geometrically natural condition, what I, what I require is that, uh, is that I take this, uh, this subset of the set of possible curvature tensors and I require it to be invariant under the action of H. So it's some sub, you know, some H invariant sub, hopefully submanifold, but not necessarily. Uh, it could be a variety with singularities sitting inside, uh, sitting inside the space of all curvature tensors, and we look for the solutions whose curvature tensors take values in that algebraic subset. I'll illustrate this in a minute. Uh, so, for example, what would, what would happen in the case of SU2 uh, as holonomy uh, sitting in S4? Uh, remember that we, we remarked that the space of curvature tensors is, in fact, the traceless symmetric 3x3 three three matrices, being acted on by uh, R by SO3, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and of course the invariants of this uh, of this quantity are in fact the symmetric functions of the eigenvalues of this uh, traceless symmetric matrix, and uh, of course the trace is zero. That would be sigma one. So it's just uh, sigma two and sigma three. Uh, the uh, sigma three being the determinant and uh, sigma two being the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues. Well, sorry, the sum of the, the symmetric function of the, of the eigenvalues. Uh, and, uh, and of course, because it's a real symmetric matrix, there's an inequality between, the, uh, between these two functions. But if you look inside this locus where the inequality holds, uh, picking an invariant subset in the plane, uh, in, the, in the locus where this inequality holds, will define a subset of these matrices whose sigma two and sigma three uh, live, in this, uh, live in this region. Uh, uh, just to, uh, before looking at that in detail, let me just mention uh, what happens in the, in the various special holonomy cases that uh, the most famous uh, uh, and most thoroughly studied is the case of the kalabi yau case of SUN sitting in SO2N there, the space of curvature tensors is again irreducible. It's the uh, it's the quartic polynomials on C n that are uh, that are by degree two two and and that are harmonic. That's the space of curvature tensors, uh, and uh, <coughs> and the and in particular in the cases n equals two and n equals three, which I'll say more about. Uh, these show up. Uh, these show up in uh, in the study of, uh, of course, you know, Calabi-Yau surfaces, and in connections with string theory and nearly Kähler geometry. Uh, the thing that got me interested in this at that time, you know, more than oh, about thirty, about what, eighty? Well, it's hard to believe, thirty-five years ago, <clears throat> uh, that. Uh, was this open question at that time about whether or not G2 actually could possibly occur as holonomy. It was known by, from the work of Alexievsky and, and, uh, uh, and Bonin that the space of curvature tensors was, in this case, 
uh, was an irreducible representation of G2, uh, V2, V02, uh, in terms of the highest weights, uh, which is a seven-dimensional seven space, and uh, and the uh, and spin seven uh, in SO8, its base of curvature tensors turns out to be uh, turns out to be uh, V020 for SO7 representation, which has space of dimension 168. I'll come back to these numbers uh, a little later. <coughs> Uh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, let's go back to the to the. Uh, I want to illustrate what happens when you when you do impose such a condition in the uh, in these uh, SU two holonomy case. Uh, <clears throat> first, without any restriction, the uh, when you compute the characters of this uh, of the tableau that's associated with this uh, with this uh, 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 with this curvature and the first prolongation of curvature. Uh, compute the characters. The characters are, are given as follows. S1, S2, S3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is, uh, is the last non-zero one, S3 is 2. And, uh, and because this dimension of A1 is in fact, according to Carton's count, uh, 2 times S2 plus 3 times S3, uh, that this satisfies Carton's conditions for, uh, for involutivity, so it's involutive, and that's basically Carton's proof. I, I believe would be Carton's proof. He like I said, he never actually, as far as we can say, as far as we know, uh, wrote down uh, any explicit argument, but this would be the natural argument that he would have made if he had. Uh, uh, so it's involutive, and the fact that it's uh, S3 is S3 is 2 is the last non-zero character. That's the statement that the general solution depends on uh, two functions of three variables up to diffeomorphism. Uh, but when we go to the algebraically special case, uh, the systems we need to study are not always involutive, in fact. And, uh, and it turns out you have to prolong the structure equations. Uh, I'm going to give a particular example, the case where the, the, case where the curvature tensor has a double root, uh, in which case, uh, if it if it has a if it has a double root, you can always uh, you can always locally, uh, as long as the root's not zero, you can smoothly diagonalize the the uh, the front, the curvature tensor, and uh, because the trace is zero, the uh, the double root that forces that to be a minus two, uh, and and uh, the R cubed there just makes it turns out to make the calculations easier. Uh, uh, whoops. Uh, okay, yeah. <clears throat> if you differentiate these equations, uh, what I want to illustrate here is if you if you now take these equations and take their uh, take their exterior derivatives, what you find is that well, R of course it's differential. It's a function down on the down on the four manifold, and so its differential has uh, is. If it's not zero, you can write 4r times, uh, times some one form down on the manifold, this uh, u0, uh, a to naught up to u3, a to 3. And it turns out that when you differentiate these structure equations, uh, because you've made a frame adaptation, uh, you've actually reduced it, to a, uh, reduced it to a circle action. And theta 2 and theta 3, they're the, they're the uh, I mean, the circle action is the theta 1 there, uh, rotating that one way in the a to zero, a to one, and rotating the other way in the a to two, a to three, and but these guys are no longer part of the part of the frame bundle when you when you diagonalize the curvature tensor, and in fact it turns out that differentiating these equations forces theta two and theta three to be these particular combinations for the same use as dr. So what we're say what you know informally what you would say is that uh, is that the uh, the set of one jets of solutions, uh, so, so well, the, the, uh, the two jets of algebraically special solutions have only one invariant, the R, and the three jets will have, uh, will have four more invariants, the U0 through U3. Unfortunately, these equations, if you now plug this all in and, and calculate the Cartan characters, this system is not involutive. And, uh, and as a result, uh, and as a result, if you want to know whether or not there are any solutions, you have, to, you have to work more. You have to differentiate these equations and apply these structure equations and see what happens. Uh, what actually happens is this. The, uh, 
when you differentiate the, those structure equations, uh, the differentials of the U's, the, the new unknowns, turn out to be expressible in terms of the coframe. Uh, uh, in terms of the known quantities, plus it turns out there's a three-parameter family of, uh, of solutions in terms of the derivatives. There's still three new variables, three new invariants that, that are not, uh, uh, that cannot be, uh, uh, that are not functions of the previous known things. Uh, and it's still not involutive. You differentiate again. Uh, and, uh, whoops, I'm having trouble controlling this thing. Uh, uh, differentiate again, and, uh, and finally you get to the point where, uh, where the, the derivatives of the new things are actually turn out to be expressible as, in fact, polynomials in, the, uh, in all the things we have so far. So you get, so uh, here's the full list. There are, there are basically eight invariant functions, eight, in, eight invariant coefficients, uh, and their derivatives are expressed purely in terms of them. And lo and behold, if you try looking for new relations among them by taking exterior derivatives of these equations, you don't get anything new. Uh, that, d, that is, as Carton would have said, uh, d squared equals zero is an identity in this case. And now Carton's uh, sort of generalization of Lee's third theorem says that there always will exist solutions for any given values of these eight quantities. There will always exist a, uh, a, a solution to the structure equations once you specify the, these eight quantities at a point. So what you can say uh, is, that, uh, is that solutions do exist, that is there are Calabi metrics for which the the, uh, the, in dimension four for which the uh, curvature tensor has a repeated root everywhere, but there's only a finite dimensional space of them. They, they exist, but they're, but they're, you know, they don't depend on arbitrary functions, they depend on only constants. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for comparison, let me go back again to the classical holonomy case with no, uh, no curvature restrictions. Uh, that is, if you look if you look at the, at the SUM case, the Cobb Yau case, the last non-zero character is two n minus one is two, which is, uh, uh, which is exactly the, uh, the generality of Cobb Yau metrics in, in uh, um, uh, up to diffeomorphism locally. And uh, when you do the calculation for G2, uh, it turns out the last non-zero character is S6 is 6, so the generic G2 metric locally depends on six functions of six variables, and, uh, and uh, I'm not sure I'll have time to talk about the nearly, the nearly Kähler or the nearly G2 structure case. I'll, uh, 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 I'll maybe uh, uh, reserve, uh, but basically there's a, there's a uh, one, can, one can specify not torsion-free structures, but, but structures that have a single non-zero torsion coefficient. This is the nearly Kähler and similar to the nearly G2 case. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and it turns out the counts are the same for those as for the torsion-free case, that is the, the holonomy case. And spin 7, the other one, uh, the other exceptional uh, holonomy, the, uh, the last non-zero character is S7 is 12, so they depend on 12 functions of seven variables. <clears throat> well, let me uh, compare that with the curvature restrictions in the possible curvature restrictions in the, uh, in the SU2 case that we've been discussing. The curvature invariants are generated by the sigma 2 and sigma 3, and uh, <clears throat> satisfying that inequality. Uh, one thing you could try to do is simply specify the, 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 the symmetric functions, the eigenvalues of some constants. Uh, uh, that's one choice you could poss possibly try and look for solutions like that. It turns out that there are no such solutions, the, uh, except, for the, except for the flat case. Uh, that is, if you put the structure equations in and, <clears throat> and prolong them, you wind up that the only compatible case is C2 is C3, is zero. Uh, you could ask for something like sigma three, uh, sigma three being zero. <clears throat> uh, it turns out that's also not involutive, and uh, and if you require that the determinant of the of the curvature tensor be zero everywhere, 
then in fact the only solution is that the that the curvature tensor be identically zeroed. On the other hand, this double eigenvalue case, this is what the this is what happens right on the edge of this inequality. The uh, this is in fact the condition for the, the eigenvalues be double. Uh, that's a curvature tensor with a non-trivial stabilizer because the double eigenvalue means that you means that you have the rotation in that double eigenvalue plane. Uh, that has a non-trivial stabilizer, and while it's not involutive, as we saw, if you prolong, you finally wind up that up to diffeomorphism, there's a two-parameter family of inequivalent solutions. Uh, not all of those are complete, but some are. And, uh, and it constructs a, a, you know, a special family that, uh, that we had not been aware of in the past. It's not algebraic, by the way, so not too surprising. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, in general, if you just take any, uh, any uh, H invariant subset and look for the solutions whose, whose uh, curvature tensors take value in that subset, that's probably an intractable problem. Uh, if you, uh, uh, just the, uh, the sheer number of calculations that you'd have to do, say, in, uh, in the SU3 case, is uh, is uh, in, and I've tried is pretty uh, is pretty daunting, uh, but what you can look for is special things. Uh, uh, in fact, we still don't know uh, if you go back to uh, this case. If you if you take the general, you know, if you what did I? Oh, it's very efficient. There's no chalk. Uh, oh, there is some chalk, right? <clears throat> So if you if you look in this uh, if you look in this locus for uh, uh, you know sigma two uh, and sigma three uh, you know so this is some uh, 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 inside of a cusp if you just take any algebraic curve sitting in here and uh, and say ask for the solution ask for the uh, the uh, ask for the the Calabi Al metrics whose curvature takes values in some in some algebraic curve like that. Uh, we we do not know which uh, which uh, uh, special holonomy metrics it's which Calabi Al metrics uh, which of these uh, uh, curves can occur when and non trivially. That's a uh, and. And if you sit down and, and say, well, I'm going to derive the necessary and sufficient conditions for that, uh, for that curve to be compatible with, uh, with the Calabi-Al uh, metrics, um, that appears to be computationally intractable. So far, uh, so far uh, we had no examples of such curves, but we don't know, uh, uh, we don't know how to characterize them. It's, a, uh, it's an interesting problem whether or not, whether or not there's some better idea for, uh, for uh, doing that classification. Anyway, uh, as I was saying, the, the, the general case is probably intractable, but, uh, uh, but um, it's probably true uh, that we can do a classification of, the, of these constraints that are either involutive or their first prolongation is involutive. That seems to be uh, seems to be uh, a computationally manageable thing to do, and uh, and uh, while while we don't have by any means uh, the I, I do not have by any means the the classification nailed down. There's uh, there's uh, a lot of progress that can be made, and uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. What the most the, all the ones that have been found so far. Uh, <clears throat> turn out to be uh, cases where the where the subset that we're looking at uh, all the things in the subset have non-trivial H stabilizers. That is, you know, of course the the Lie group H acts on this. This is a representation space of H, and uh, and so you can look for things that have non-trivial stabilizers in there, and that defines some subset, the the set that consists of curvatures with non-trivial stabilizers. And while it's not a smooth manifold, uh, it's uh, of course it can be stratified into smooth pieces. It's algebraic, uh, and uh, and 
And looking in that locus turns out to, in fact, all the cases that I know of uh, where, you, where you get to involutivity or compatibility all lie inside this locus that has have non-trivial sta H stabilizers. And, uh, <clears throat> and, the, uh, and my, uh, the, you know, in the spirit of, uh, in the spirit of Berger's, uh, you know, writing down a table of examples, uh, of, of table of the classification, I thought I would point out what this looks like in the case of, uh, uh, in sort of the next interesting case. Uh, suppose you, suppose we go, I mean, the SU2 case, we already know the only case where you have a non-trivial stabilizer in SU2 is exactly the, the double eigenvalue case. Uh, and, we've, and I just went through that analysis that the double eigenvalue case definitely does exist. Uh, and, uh, but if we go up one dimension into, uh, into uh, looking at three-dimensional Calabi metrics, and we look for, and we ask that the uh, and we ask, and we look for the space of curvature tensors that have non-trivial stabilizers. Well, uh, non-trivial stabilizer is, of course, a subgroup of, uh, say, a, let's say, positive dimensional stabilizers. Uh, a positive dimensional stab stabilizer of, of SU3, fortunately, there's not SU3 being ranked 2. There are not too many subgroups, closed subgroups of SU3. And you can just look at the, at the subgroups uh, you can look at the subgroups, uh, you can list the subgroups that have non-trivial stabilizers in, uh, in the space of curvature tensors. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in this case, uh, uh, U2, uh, which uh, if you look at the set of curvature tensors that can occur in a three-dimensional Calabi Yau that have, uh, that have uh, U2 as a stabilizer at every point, then, uh, then in fact, that's a that's a one-dimensional space sitting inside the sitting inside this uh, uh, this space which has dimension 27, uh, and uh, and uh, the way to think about this U2 is, is of course it's the subgroup of SU3 that splits uh, splits off a line, uh, and it's easy to show. Uh, in fact, this is well known that there's a one-dimensional family of such things. Uh, these are the rotationally invariant Calabi Al uh, metrics in dimension three uh, that are not, I mean, well, of course, the flat one is the, is, belongs to the family, but there's a one parameter family of them that are not flat. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if you look at SU2, uh, then it turns out that, turns out that that still has only a one dimensional uh, family, of, uh, family of solutions. Uh, family of invariant curvature tensors. Of course, that splits off the because you're picking out a determinant that C splits as an R plus R, and again, it's still one constant. There's no more no more solutions than that. If you look at another subgroup, for example, if you look at SO3 sitting inside uh, sitting inside SU3, uh, if you look at SO3, that also leaves invariant one a one-dimensional uh, subgroup of the uh, of the curvature tensors. Uh, and SO3 acts as, uh, as uh, preserving the real and imaginary parts of C3. Uh, but it turns out that this never occurs. This, uh, there is no, uh, there is no uh, metric, there is no Calabi Al metric with, uh, uh, where the curvature tensor always preserves the splitting like this. On the other hand, if you now go uh, the, you know, sort of the next, if you look at a maximal torus sitting in SU3, uh, maximal torus, of course, preserves the splitting of C3 into, into three lines. It turns out there's a three-dimensional family of these, of, of curvature tensors that are invariant under the maximal torus. And the analysis that, analogous to what I did for the SU2 case, uh, if you look at the, if you ask that the curvature tensor take values in the conjugates of this guy, then it turns out there's an eight-parameter family of such, uh, of such metrics. Uh, most of them are not complete, but some of them are. Uh, but they're, uh, uh, it's fairly, uh, fairly large, uh, fairly large family. Uh, if you take uh, now the only other, I mean, I, I've exhausted the rank two groups and the rank one group that, acts it, that, uh, 
that's not one dimensional, uh, the rank one subgroups that are not one dimensional. And then there are the circles that sit inside T2. If you take the generic circle, that is, uh, you know, remember in T2, just think of the, think of it as uh, S1 cross S1, and then the, the compact subgroups of that are, are, you know, an S1, whoops, an S1 running in two, uh, you know, with two, uh, two slopes, P over Q. Uh, the generic one has, uh, which looks like this, where P and Q are not zero and one, uh, is this circle diagonal matrices. They have the same stabilizer as T2, and so the answer is the same. Hmm? It's a rational number. Is what? Rational number. Rational number, P over Q, yeah. Uh, in, otherwise, we don't get a closed subgroup. It, it, once you close it up, you get back to T2. Uh, there are two other special, whoops, whoops, back up. There are two other special cases, though. If you look at things of slope, uh, of slope uh, zero, so it actually fixes one of, the, one of the C's and then just acts as the conjugate action in the other two. It turns out the space of curvature tensors is five dimensional. And there, uh, and there the calculations, <sighs> this thing keeps, the calculations are, are complicated, but they, uh, but they wind up, um, it appears that the, uh, it appears that this, that you get an integrable system where the solutions depend on uh, two functions of one variable. The question mark is because there's a, uh, um, uh, what's the right thing to say? The, uh, the uh, in order to get to that point, I had to make some, uh, some uh, non-degeneracy assumptions, and it's conceivable that, uh, and I've not completed this calculation, it's conceivable that, that, that there are some degeneracies that show up here that are not captured in the S1 equals two. Uh, that's, uh, that's work in progress. But there are a lot of these, uh, there are, all, are a lot of these metrics that have their curvatures invariant under, a cir under that circle action. What's even more interesting is that the, there's one other particular circle that has a lot of invariant curvature tensors, and that's the thing of slope one. Uh, the circle of slope one, P and Q are equal. Uh, and that turns out to have a seven-dimensional family of invariant, uh, of invariant curvature tensors. Again, it preserves the splitting uh, uh, C plus C plus C, uh, acts irreducibly there, and there the count appears to be S1 is four. Again, they're the same degeneracy cases that show up here show up in the seven case, which is not too surprising, but, uh, uh, and they still need to be resolved, but again, you get, uh, there is a, there is a, a general family uh, that depends, uh, that's, that's very, fairly flexible in the, uh, in the uh, uh, slope one case. Uh, we still don't know anything about completeness. These things, uh, the, the solutions actually show up, uh, are, can be described in terms of, uh, of families of pseudo-holomorphic curves in an almost complex manifold that, uh, that uh, we, we don't have any good understanding of its completeness properties right now. Just to, uh, just to do, the, do the next interesting case, the, the case in fact that, that, I was, that I wanted to understand because uh, you may know we are, I and Simon and, and, uh, and uh, eight other of my cop PIs are involved in a Simons collaboration on uh, special holonomy in, uh, in geometry analysis and physics. And, uh, and part, of our, part of our project is to understand special solutions of the, of, the, uh, of the G2 holonomy equations. And so a natural thing to do, and this was what really got me started on the project, was, uh, was uh, looking for ways to find new solutions uh, new global solutions. Uh, and in fact, what Simon and I had done uh, years ago, I guess it was in 1987, uh, <clears throat> uh, was we had looked for cohomogeneity one solutions. And, uh, and you know, again, if you look at the list of subgroups of G2, there they are, uh, closed subgroups of G2, uh, 
there's, uh, there's quite a long list, but of course the first one, if you look at SU3, that's a maximal subgroup. If you look for, there, it doesn't leave invariant any curvature tensors. It doesn't leave any invariant any G2 curvature tensors at all. And so, uh, and so, uh, so the only case that could possibly occur there is the flat case. Uh, but for SO4 and U2, one, one of the, there are two uh, non-congruent U2s, non-conjugate U2s in G2. Uh, that, uh, but for these two particular ones, uh, uh, although we didn't think of finding them this way, this is what they actually turned out to be. Uh, it, we, sh we had constructed G2 holonomy metrics on the, on, uh, on the self-dual bundles of, uh, of S4 and CP2, uh, self-dual uh, two-form bundles of S4 and CP2, and it turned out that their curvatures took, take values exactly in these, uh, in these uh, uh, special... Um, the, these special orbits in the, in the KG2 that have non-trivial stabilizers. Uh, so, the, you know, from this point of view, those two things show up completely naturally without assuming, without assuming homogeneity one or anything like that, just assuming a natural condition on the, on the curvature tensor. Uh, if you look at the other U2 that's, uh, that's not conjugate to this U, U2 sitting in G2, it turns out that they, these guys don't exist. Even though they have the same dimension space of invariant curvature tensors, it turns out that this, uh, that this U2, which acts preserving a line, a two-plane, and an R4, uh, that's incompatible. There are no solutions there. In uh, T2, there's a, the maximal torus in there. There's a five-dimensional space of invariant curvature tensors, and it leaves only constants. Uh, I, I have by no means uh, completed the analysis and all these things, but some interesting things have happened. Uh, I mean, like cases like this, where, where surprisingly you don't get any solutions. Uh, but again, uh, when you get down to the torus to the circle actions, it turns out that you get, uh, you get solutions that, uh, that, appear on, that appear on arbitra uh, depend on arbitrary functions of one variable. Uh, this one is a complete mystery to me though. The, uh, the, if you look at this particular circle sitting inside the, uh, all these circles of course sit inside the maximal torus which sits inside the SU3, so you can think of them as, as the, the P and Q have the same interpretation as before. Uh, and, uh, and this particular guy, this slope zero one, uh, turns out to have an enormous number of invariant curvature tensors. And, uh, and understanding what its space of solutions looks like is uh, uh, at, the moment, uh, at the moment beyond my technology. Um, but we do have, I mean, we do have kind of a, a plan for completing this. It's just uh, at the moment uh, there's still there still remains several cases to resolve, but the cases that we have resolved, or, or even partially resolved, have already given us some interesting uh, interesting uh, new new geometry and new metrics. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't have that much longer to go uh, for part two, and uh, I'd, so I may have to uh, I may have to uh, sort of narrow what I'm saying, but I just wanted to point out that the analogous thing that, uh, that you can look for, uh, uh, you know, Lawson and Harvey introduced the notion of calibrated geometry, I mean, de wrote a, a fundamental paper on calibrated geometries in the early 80s that was largely inspired by, uh, by understanding these geometries in special dimensions that, because they were, they were special because of the holonomy, this uh, G2 and spin 7 holonomy, and they pointed out that they were connected to various minimal submanifolds, the, the so-called associative submanifolds being the, uh, uh, for example, in R7, uh, <clears throat> which are exactly, you know, if you look at G2's action on, uh, on R7, acting irreducibly on R7, if you look at the, at the planes, the three planes that are equivalent under G2 action to R3, that sweeps out uh, this famous uh, this famous symmetric space of G two sitting inside the Grassmannian of oriented three planes in R seven, 
the associate of Grassmannian, and uh, and as Harvey and Lawson proved, this uh, this uh, any any uh, uh, any three manifold whose tangent plane is everywhere an associative plane is in fact not only minimal but absolutely minimizing in homology uh, with respect to fixed boundary, and and of course this generalizes to uh, to arbitrary. Uh, uh, G2 manifolds, the notion of an associative submanifold. Um, <clears throat> in the general case, if you have a group acting by isometries on Rn and you have a G orbit of, of M planes, you can talk about sigma manifolds whose tangent places, spaces belong to sigma. And, the, and of course, the Gauss map then uh, maps into sigma. Uh, and it has a derivative which is maps the tangent plane into the tangent plane of the Grassmannian of uh, the, the sigma, which is, and the tangent plane is, sits inside the normal bundle tensor, tensor the tangent bundle, which uh, looks like this. And because of symmetry, this, uh, you can think of the, Gauss, the derivative of the Gauss map as the second fundamental form. It actually sits inside this space, the tangent space of sigma tensor, the cotangent bundle, intersected with the normal tensor sim2. And so you should think of this intersection as the space of possible second fundamental forms for sigma manifolds. G is compact. G is compact. Um, uh, in this case, I'm going I'm to say G is acting by isometries. It's a closed subgroup, and, uh, and it's compact. Uh, you get a, for this class of submanifolds, uh, Generalizing the associative case, you get a notion of uh, you get a notion of what are the possible second fundamental forms, uh, uh, <clears throat> and in general, these uh, all of these spaces, of course, the the subspace R M is perpendicular, and the tangent space of the Grassmannian are all H modules. So this guy is an actual uh, uh, H, it's a representation space of H, the set of possible second fundamental forms. And uh, so, for example, in the case of special Lagrangians, uh, where G is, uh, G is SUM uh, and H is SOM, then uh, so these are the, the orbit of RM under this action is the space of special Lagrangian tangent planes. And there, it turns out, you can calculate that the space of second mineral forms is exactly, is exactly uh, the traceless cubic forms in M variables. And, uh, and, for example, when M is 3, this is R7. Uh, and uh, and uh, what you can do is look for, uh, look for uh, special Lagrangian threefolds, which is a, you know, this is a, a nonlinear PDE that's, in fact, quite difficult to understand what its singular solutions look like uh, and uh, what kinds of singularities they can have and so forth, which is a, something of intense interest in our uh, in our understanding of, uh, of associative submanifolds of, uh, of uh, G2 manifolds. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and if you look at the, uh, uh, if you look at the space of, of Lagrangian threefolds whose second monomial forms have non-trivial symmetry, that's the analog of what we were discussing for, non, for curvature tensors with non-trivial symmetry. Uh, we find out that there are lots of many that there are many integrable cases and connections with uh, connections with integrable systems. Uh, my student Marianti Enel did a similar case for the uh, for the m equals four case and found many integrable cases there. Uh, I want to just say what happens in the associative threefold case. Uh, if you look at uh, here, G is G two. The stabilizer of a three of this three plane is a copy of SO4, as I was saying. Uh, so that the Grassmannian is is the associative Grassmannian is G2 mod SO4. Uh, the stabilizer it's spin four, so it's SP1 SP1. So the so uh, uh, it's not hard to calculate that the that the tangent plane is in fact uh, the the three one irreducible representation for SO4 using those as the two maximal tori, uh, which is sim3 of one of them tensor over the quaternion, they're both quaternionic vector spaces, tensor uh, the fundamental representation of the second one as an eight-dimensional space. Uh, when you calculate the second fundamental form, 
uh, as a representation space. It's, uh, it's five-dimensional. Uh, I mean, it's S5 V wound tensor uh, V01. And uh, so it's a 12-dimensional space. And, uh, and, but the point that you want to you carry from this irreducible, from this realization of it as a representation space is that you can think of the second fundamental form as a quintic polynomial in two complex variables. It's a, I mean, as an abstract space, this is kind of hard to understand what the action looks like. But it turns out that if you interpret the second fundamental form as a quintic polynomial in two complex variables, then the second fundamental form up to, at a point, up to a multiple can be thought of as a degree five rational mapping of CP1 to CP1 up to isometric actions on the two CP1s. That is, you want to understand the degree five rational mappings up to isometric rotations in the domain and range two spheres. That's what the, that's what the, the SP1 and SP1 act as isometric uh, rotations in, this, in the two CP1s. And this geometric picture of it makes it easier to bring algebraic geometry into the picture. Uh, uh, let me, I'm going to skip the co-associative case. Uh, we didn't talk about that anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we can work out the stabilizer types in the, in the associative case. Uh, if, uh, if you have one of these uh, associative second fundamental forms with non-trivial stabilizer, then the orbit of P is one of the following. Uh, the, it could be a, a, a quintic power. It could be, uh, could be a fourth power times, uh, times a linear term. Could be cubic and, cubic and quadratic. All of those have a circle as a stabilizer, a different circle, but a circle as a stabilizer. Uh, it could have stabilizer Z4. Uh, it looks like this. It could have stabilizer, uh, stabilizer Z3, if it looks like this. And it could have, and I was noticing when I was looking over my slides earlier, that should be a 2 there, not a, uh, not a 3, because it's got to be a quintic. It could have stabilizer Z2. Those are the possible stabilizer types. And... Uh, and there are some inequalities you have to be sure. For example, you don't want B to be zero because then that puts you back in case one. Things, there's some inequalities to make sure the stabilizers stay exactly that, uh, but I won't go through the details. Um, and, and like I said, these three circles sitting in SO4 are all non-conjugate to each other. Uh, they, so they correspond to completely different geometries even though they, the stabilizers all look the same. Uh, <clears throat> so, for example, it turns out that the, uh, the associative threefolds whose second fundamental forms have this type turn out to be ruled surfaces. They depend on six functions of one variable, and they can be interpreted as pseudo-holomorphic curves in an almost complex three-manifold. In fact, they correspond one-to-one -one with uh, pseudo-holomorphic curves in an almost complex three-manifold. <clears throat> and... Uh, more generally, if you look at for ruled associative threefolds, it turns out that they can be interpreted as uh, pseudo-holomorphic curves in, uh, naturally in a almost complex structure on the, on the space of lines in R7. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that, so maybe I'll skip that. Uh, <clears throat> it turns out that if you go to the second type, the second stabilizer type that has a circle symmetry, uh, it turns out there are none of those. That's uh, again, it turns out there's no the compatibility conditions. Uh, you know, when you differentiate, eliminate those cases. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, if you look at the third type that has a circle symmetry, uh, they actually turn out to be special Lagrangian in in some R6 sitting in R7, and uh, and in fact they're the Harvey Lawson examples with an SO3 symmetry. Uh, so even if you hadn't known about those to begin with, they would, they would have been found by this process of looking for things with non-trivial stabilizers in their second fundamental forms. Uh, <clears throat> in Z4, it turns out that these uh, actually have, uh, that, you know, that if the second fundamental form looks like this everywhere, then either A is zero or B is zero. And so, uh, and so they, uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, you don't get anything beyond the two cases that we already discussed, and even the A equals zero case uh, puts you back in proposition two that says they don't really exist. 
Uh, the Z3 case, uh, that case, it turns out that those uh, actually turn out to be special Lagrangian uh, also in an R6. And, uh, and, uh, and they were classified in this 2000 paper, the, the, uh, this, the associated threefolds that have a Z3 symmetry, uh, because it turns out that as special Lagrangian things, they have a Z3 symmetry, and they were classified. Um, yeah. uh, Z2 is the hardest case. There's still, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to, uh, to finish the calculations in that. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of examples. There are special cases, uh, but it breaks up into a, into, a large, uh, into a large constellation of degenerate cases that, uh, that I, I have not yet tracked down. So I can't tell you what happens there. But again, it breaks up into a collection of different integrable systems that we had never seen connected with, uh, connected with associative submanifolds before, associative threefolds in R7 before. Uh, and uh, and uh, exploring that connection is one of the things that I, that I and, uh, and a couple of my graduate students are working on now. Um, yeah, so the, I would say the, the, the take home message is that there's, uh, that if you look for geometric conditions, that is algebraic conditions on the curvature tensors, that, uh, that, that are involutive and compatible, uh, it's, a, it's a natural way of finding connections with integrable systems. And uh, uh, the, right now, I, I think we only have scratched the surface in, in understanding that connection uh, and, uh, and being able to find out which of those things are compatible with complete solutions is another story that we uh, that we still don't understand completely either, but uh, but it's a it's to my mind a, a promising way to to understand uh, understand uh, these uh, these reductions to integrable systems that that turn up every now and then, and uh, and um, I, I, it also uh, strikes me as sort of in the spirit of. Berger's classification of holonomy, uh, in that in that uh, there's a clear uh, there's a clear set of problems that you need to go through the list to to get things, and when you but when you come to to the end, there's an interesting list of solutions, and they were completely unpredictable until you actually sit down and do the calculation. Uh, that's uh, so far uh, so far we're um, you know it's something we're exploring and uh, and. I, my fondest hope is that one, one day it will turn out to be as beautiful a story as the Holonomy story has been. And, uh, and I think my time is essentially up. I'll stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions? I have one. <laughs> I have? How do you recognize an integrable system there in this setting? Um, yeah, so uh, when you say recognize an integrable system, the, uh, <clears throat> there's, uh, you know, uh, what's the best way, thing to say? Uh, you know, when you talk to integrable systems people, they always, the fundamental question is, what is an integrable system? Right. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a book written by the experts called What is an integrability? What is integrability? Right. Uh, <clears throat> this is you know in some sense integrability is a, is uh, you know one thing is that you can you can actually sometimes make a direct comparison between uh, the integrable si the system you found and a known integrable system. For example, sine Gordon or Cinch Gordon and so forth. That's one thing. And the other. Uh, the other interesting case is that uh, is that you find see all of these cases that turned out that with s1 is some positive number and all the higher ones are zero. Those all reduce to those all reduce to systems of PDE on a Riemann surface, ultimately. And these systems of PDE are overdetermined, and you wouldn't expect them to have solutions, but they do. And uh, uh, it's. You know, while I can't in every case 
write down a connection with a spectral curve, which is one of the things that the integrable systems people really like is uh, their, their method of, of uh, their method of bringing it into the integrable fold is to, is to, uh, is to write down a nonlinear eigenvalue problem and, uh, and get a spectral curve and that, you know, that gets attached to the Riemann surface in a, in a specific way. And, uh, and whenever that happens, they say it's integrable. But uh, in this particular case, uh, it's not it's not it's not the the strongest form of integrability where you can actually say I can write down all the solutions in terms of holomorphic uh, functions. That is, uh, that's the that's the uh, that's the Liouville phenomena. But it's sort of the next stage that you uh, that you have an overdetermined system where uh, where the, uh, that you wouldn't normally expect to have solutions, and, uh, and yet they're compatible. Mm -hmm. yeah. so in connection with the question, so it's, in, it's, it's there that uh, when you were um, uh, explaining that uh, when you have this R7 and you were reducing with respect to group SO4 and mm -hmm. U2 sub 1, you have this mm -hmm. uh, uh, cell dual bundle over this S4 mm -hmm. and uh, CP2. Mm -hmm. These are the right. connections of whatever you were saying with integrability, these ASDs and young mill self-dual equations as well as your holonomic conditions there. Actually, yeah. the, uh, there, are, there are ways to write down solutions of the, of the holonomy equations in terms of solutions of yang mills equations. The, there, so there's a, right, but, but this particular this particular writing down the SU, the, writing down the the G two metrics on lambda two plus of S four and CP two, that's uh, you know that wasn't done by dimension reduction in that sense uh, to a, to a Yang Mill system. It was actually reduced to, yes, reduced to an ODE system. Yeah. You have this. Uh, yeah. There's a paper mm. by Atia and uh, Pot. They actually yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that where they where they write down the where they write down solutions to the to the self dual Yang Mills yes, equations yes. in terms of uh, in terms of a classical integrable system. That's a you know it's a that's a different phenomena from what I'm describing here, but or or as far as I know, it's different. There there may be a connection that I'm not aware of. You said the word about uh, getting complete solutions. Do, do, you, do you have any idea whether there will be one of the cases which will be definitely simpler or um, for which you have uh, maybe other tools to get to? Let's see. Uh, well, to, to prove completeness in the cases where I, where I can prove completeness, it's because, uh, it's because when you write down those structure equations as I was showing in the, in the it, right at the beginning at the, for the for the SU2s with a double eigenvalue, uh, uh, what you need to do to prove completeness is you need to prove that, that certain covariant derivatives d are bounded by other covariant derivatives to guarantee that nothing blows up in finite distance. And for that, you need to, you need to actually get a formula for those covariant derivatives because those formulas will tell you what the, you know, once you have all eight quantities, you know what all their derivatives are. So if you want to show that something's not growing too fast, uh, you basically what you want to do is prove you have this this uh, basically you have a vector field that you're trying to trying to show it's complete in this R8 uh, in this in this eight dimensional uh, space of invariance, and uh, and for that you need uh, you know something like a Lyapunov function to guarantee that you guarantee that you can't run off to to infinity and finite time, and uh, and uh, in that case you have we have the I, I didn't put up the formulas because they're you know you, at first glance you can't tell what they mean, but uh, uh, in that case you can actually use those formulas to get such a function to tell you when tell you when the uh, when uh, of the curvature and its covariant derivatives stay bounded in finite distance, and that. To coupled with Carton's existence theorem is enough to show that those things are complete. They might be complete orbifolds that that you that you can't rule out. They they might actually uh, they might develop orbifold orbifold singularities, but uh, but they won't develop. Uh, you know they'll they'll be locally smooth and complete.
Complete with always be non-compact. Yes, all of these are non-compact. Right. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Back to the SU2 case, the drawing is still on the right. board. You made the claim that you cannot prescribe a laboratory curve as a value. Yeah, you, but there's you still cannot do maybe that. A, That's you right. cannot, but, but right. there is still maybe a family which you can deal with, which right. is like something close to the cusp since you have this result. And then right. maybe you can hope for some continuity result in the carton system. And yeah, that's uh, a question. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the thing is that. Uh, the curve, any curve that admits a non-trivial solution has to satisfy a set of differential equations in this space, right? And, uh, and we don't know, uh, we don't know, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, we don't know enough about what those solutions look like to be able to, to be able to say that we could make something close, something that looks close to the cusp. Oh, oh, if it was, uh, oh, if it was non-compact and well, non-compact always occurs, uh, always. Um, no, that's not true. The idea is just using some continuity in the, in the uh, system, the Carton system. Yeah, uh, well, you do have continuity in the Carton system. So if you get one compact solution, uh, then you can then you can get uh, 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 for a given algebraic curve then you can get uh, that the nearby ones are compact, right? I mean, not compact, complete. Yeah, that's right. If you, if, you get, uh, if you get one of the, that's right. If you get one complete, then you can show that the nearby ones are complete. That's right. Yeah. OK, if there are no more questions, thanks for a great talk. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks.